Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel. It is good to be with you here on day 606. My microphone connection is kind of coming and going. So, okay. <laughs> it's good to be with you here for day number 606 as we're in 2 Chronicles 29 and uh, one of the best kings in the history of God's people, Hezekiah comes to the throne. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help as we dig into this chapter together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the, the challenge that your word is to us, for how it confronts us in our sin. Thank you also for how it points us to our Savior, how it shows us the pattern of life that you would have us to walk in as your people. We pray that you would teach us today and write your word on our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Okay, 2 Chronicles 29. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years at Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them, he brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in a square on the east and said, Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what is evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. They also shut the doors on the vestibule and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord came upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of horror, of astonishment, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons, and our daughters, and our wives are in captivity for this. Now, it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not now be negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, and to be his ministers, and make offerings to him. Then the Levites arose, Mahath, the son of Amasai, and Joel, the son of Azariah, of the sons of the Kohathites, and of the sons of Merari, Kish, the son of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jehalel, Jehalel, and of the Gershonites, Joah, the son of Zima, and Eden, the son of Joah, and of the sons of Elzapan, Shimri, and Jewel, and of the sons of Asaph, Zechariah, and Mataniah, and of the sons of Heman, Jehuel and Shimei, and of the sons of Jeduthun, Shemaiah, and Uziel. They gathered their brothers and consecrated themselves and went in, as the king commanded, by the words of the Lord, to cleanse the house of the Lord. The priests went into the inner parts of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, and they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord, into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it, and carried it out to the brook Kidron. They began to consecrate on the first day of the first month, and on the eighth day of the month they came into the vestibule of the Lord. Then for eight days they consecrated the house of the Lord, and on the sixteenth day of the first month they finished. Then they went to into Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils, and the table for the showbread and all its utensils, all the utensils that King Ahaz discarded in his reign because when he was faithless, we have made ready and consecrated, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. Then Hezekiah the king rose early and gathered the officials of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary and for Judah. 
And he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they slaughtered the bulls, and the priests received the blood and threw it against the altar. And they slaughtered the rams, and their blood was thrown against the altar. And they slaughtered the lambs, and their blood was thrown against the altar. Then the goats for the sin offering were brought to the king and the assembly, and they laid their hands on them, and the priests slaughtered them and made a sin offering with their blood on the altar to make atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres, according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offering be offered on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also, and the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. When the offering was finished, the king and all who were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. And Hezekiah the king and the officials commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed down and worshipped. Then Hezekiah said, You have now consecrated yourselves to the Lord. Come near, bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings, and all who were of a willing heart brought burnt offerings. The number of the burnt offerings that the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, and 200 lambs. All these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. And the consecrated offerings were 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep. But the priests were too few and could not flay all the burnt offerings. So until other priests had consecrated themselves, their brothers the Levites helped them until the work was finished. For the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests in consecrating themselves. Besides the great number of burnt offerings, there was the fat of the peace offerings, and there were the drink offerings for the burnt offerings. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced, because God had provided for the people, for the thing came about suddenly. That is Second Chronicles chapter 29. Uh, we get a lot more detail of this early part of the reign of Hezekiah here in Chronicles than we do in, in Kings. And so in Kings, almost everything about Hezekiah's reign deals with the Assyrian crisis of 701 BC. That's when the Assyrians, you know, destroyed the villages and the towns of Judah and then marched on Jerusalem and the Lord miraculously delivered. But here the chronicler is spending a considerable amount of time, this whole chapter, detailing for us exactly what Hezekiah did in cleansing the temple, in having the Levites and the priests consecrate themselves, and in reestablishing temple worship. And of course, why did he do that? We've already commented on this before in Chronicles, but the chronicler is writing at the time of the restoration of Israel to the promised land. Whereas Kings is written when Judah is being taken off into captivity as a judgment. And so the emphasis is on judgment and the wrath of God and invading and opposing powers. Here, the people of God are being restored to the land. And their priority in being restored to the land needs to be the reestablishment of temple worship. They were pursuing all sorts of other priorities. They wanted to plant crops and harvest. They wanted to rebuild their homes. They wanted to rebuild their cities and their towns, and they needed to rebuild the house of the Lord. And this is what the what we call the post-exilic prophets of Haggai in particular um, emphasize, is this need for the people of God to focus on rebuilding the temple. And that's why the chronicler writes the way that he does. It's part of the call that God is using 
to motivate the people of God to put their focus in the same place where Hezekiah is putting his focus. Hezekiah is a righteous king. He's not a perfect king. Later on in his reign, he's going to be foolish and he's going to be acting out of pride, but he is a righteous king. He's one of the most righteous of all the kings, as we will see uh, as we continue through his reign over the next uh, few days. Uh, tomorrow we'll be back in 1 John, but we're going to be continuing in this section of Second Chronicles for, for a few more days, and that's what we'll see. Uh, but what's, what's the takeaway that we can have from this? Well, I think one of the things we need to see is that the worship of God needs to have first place priority in our lives. Notice it was in the first year of his reign, in the first month that he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. We are called to view our lives, not the way the world views it, which is that the beginning of the week is Monday morning when you wake up and go to work, and then you work all week long for the weekend, and then the weekend of Saturday and Sunday is how you relax and, and sort of enjoy yourself until the work week begins again Monday morning. That is not that is not a biblical pattern of worship or life. That is not really the pattern of life that was set up for hundreds and hundreds of years under a sort of Christian, Judeo-Christian understanding of the world. Sunday is the first day of the week. And in the morning, on the first day of the week, the first thing that is our first priority is to gather with God's people for worship. Just as Hezekiah, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them, we should wake up and say, in the first day of the week, the first thing in the morning, we should be getting ready for church and going to church. We should take the first of our income and give it as tithes and offerings to the Lord and to his worship and to his church. That 10% from the top, not let's pay all of our bills and take care of all of our entertainment needs and see what's left over at the end. Worship needs to have our first priority in our schedule and in our budgeting because God is the most worthy one. I'm not just saying that because I'm a pastor and you know, I want people to give all their money to the church. I'm saying it because as a Christian, God is our highest good. God is our highest joy. God is our highest priority. And we need to be committed to the worship of God. One other thing I want us to see very briefly from this long chapter is how the Levites were there and how they were more consecrated uh, to God, more dedicated to God than the priests. This is specifically highlighted here in verse 34. The priests were too few. They could not flay all the burnt offerings. And so until other priests had consecrated themselves, their brothers, the Levites, helped them until the work was finished, for the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests in consecrating themselves. And so this verse 34 is telling us that God is concerned that we are dedicated to to his work and to being his people. Now, we are all priests and Levites, as it were, under the new covenant. We are all the universal priesthood of all believers. We are all consecrated to God. It is our calling to be able to make intercession for the world and for our fellow believers. It is our calling to be able to offer up a living sacrifice of our lives and the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips giving thanks to his name. But we need to be consecrated to that. We need to see ourselves as the holy people of God that God has made us to be. And here we need to be more like the Levites and less like the priests who were sort of half-hearted in their consecration. We need to see ourselves as God's holy people set aside for his holy calling. And of course, you know who did that perfectly, right? Of course, it's the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus made the worship of God his highest priority. He would go away overnight and pray all night. He would go away early in the morning and seek solitude so that he could pray to his father. He was always in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his regular custom, and he would often read scripture and preach there. Jesus made the worship of God his first priority, and he, he consecrated himself to the work that God the Father had called him to do, even though it was a very difficult and ultimately self-sacrificing work that he was called to do. He was consecrated to it wholeheartedly. And so let's follow in the footsteps of Jesus, make the worship of God our highest priority, and consecrate ourselves because God has set us apart 
for his purposes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. Thank you that he fully dedicated himself to do the work that you gave him to do, the work of our salvation. We are righteous, we are holy, we are forgiven, we are redeemed, we are reconciled to you because of what Jesus did and Jesus alone and his absolute commitment to doing your will. We pray that you would help us to pay, take up our cross and follow Jesus, to die to our selfish agenda, make the worship of you and your kingdom and your people our highest priority, that we would be consecrated to the work you've given us to do as your children, as your saints, as your ambassadors in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me for Second Chronicles 29. I do hope you have a blessed day in the Lord.